What's up, folks? Welcome back to Tactical Tortoise. My name is Trevi, and welcome to another episode of The Best Armies in Warhammer 40k, the weekly video series where we go through the undefeated lists from the past weekend of competitive events. This episode is for the weekend of April 13th and 14th, and it was an absolutely insane weekend, not only for single-player events, but also for team events. We had several large team events go down, including the event that I am currently, at the time of recording, coming back from streaming the ATC Florida five-player team event. So if you want to see some insane games from a wide variety of competitive teams, including a couple games from Team Art of War, please go check that out over on the live tab on the channel. But what we are going to be focusing on today are the singles events of the weekend, of which we still had quite a few and some really cool results to talk about. And we can discuss all of that in the metagame breakdown. So what we have undefeated this week, Tau taking down two events, going undefeated at the Los Angeles Classic. They also took down the Mod Hammer GT, which we'll be talking about in the video. Space Marines themselves took down no less than four events with all of them using different chapters. We did see Classic Space Marines with no chapter selected go undefeated at Bedlam in the Berg, but we also saw Blood Angels take down the Tar Hero Ch Charity GT. Space Wolves actually win the Los Angeles Classic, and Black Templars taking down the Game Bunker Spring GT. We then saw Imperial Knights also at Bedlam in the Berg. That event had multiple undefeateds. That one and the Los Angeles Classic ended up with two 5 and 0 players at the end of the weekend. Eldari won the Anzac Cup. Grey Knights coming back from a week of kind of hiatus, taking down the number 3 GT. Necrons taking the double decker decimation. Death Guard at the Pandemonium GT. Adeptus Sororitas winning Montana Beer Hammer. Chaos Demons at Vanquish 2020. 24 and last but certainly not least my wizardy boys the thousand sons taking down the moonsterland gt a ton of different factions going undefeated and while we are seeing a little bit of an overrepresentation of tau this week they are going to be changing moving on into the future uh, with their updated codex so uh we are still on the previous sort of release index Tau at the time of recording. Now, we're going to dive into lists, and we'll talk about those Tau in particular. We will go into Mod Hammer, where Paul McKelvey went undefeated with the faction. We'll run through this list very quickly because, it, again, it is using the index rules, not the full codex rules, so things will change for this faction in the coming weeks. This list was led by Commander Shadow Sun. We also saw an exemplar of the Kalyan Crisis Battlesuit. Interestingly, not a Cold Star. And Long Strike. We had two individual broadside battle suits, as well as a larger unit of two broadside battle suits for a total of four, those ones all equipped with heavy rail rifles. We then saw two units of three crisis battle suits, three hammerhead gunships, three piranhas, two units of stealth battle suits, two units of tetras, and one unit of Vespid Stingwings, bringing up the rear to act as utility. Commander Shadow Sun gives that aura of rerolls, super good for buffing not only the big heavy vehicles like the Hammerheads, but also those individual broadside battle suits. She can really compound the effectiveness of the army, making the smaller units without attached characters a little bit more efficient than they would normally be, even without those attached characters. Now with that, we'll move on to the Space Marine factions, and let's dive in talking about the Tar Heel Charity GT, where Frank Virouette went undefeated with Blood Angels. Now, we have seen this list a couple of times. It was a Sons of Sanguinius list, running two captains, a chaplain with Visage of Death, allowing him to have the objective control characteristic of enemies in his engagement range. That was a foot ground-pounding chaplain, so he was able to jump into one of the units of five just standard Death Company Marines in the list. We also had Lamartis jumping into a big unit of ten Death Company Marines with jump packs alongside the Sanguinor himself. Two Assault Intercessor squads gave spaces for the captains to jump into, and those guys could mount into two of the army's impulsors. No Land Raiders today. We are just taking the smaller dedicated transports alongside a Rhino to house those units of Death Company Marines. We also had two units of Assault Intercessors with jump packs. These guys are becoming a more and more popular inclusion with Sons of Sanguinius, largely for their high attack volume and mortal wounds on the charge, and those kind of basic melee attacks they have are incredibly strong when combined with the Sons of Sanguinius detachment ability. We then had two ball predators, two units of five foot 
mounted Death Company Marines to go into the Rhino, as I mentioned before. Uh, a big unit of 10 jump pack Death Company Marines. Those ones were attaching with Lamartis, plus two scout squads and a Calidus Assassin for uppy downies and to complete some secondaries. We have talked about the Sons of Sanguinius list at length re uh, recently. The captains with the Assault Intercessors are an incredible damage package. They get full wound rerolls against enemies on an objective from attaching into the Assault Intercessors, and with their own finest hour ability can do absolutely ludicrous damage. These guys taking Mastercrafted power weapons and shields so that they get uh, even more attacks and more chances to generate their devastating wounds on their finest hour turn. Now moving on, we had a similarly aggressive list. This one going 5-0 at the Los Angeles Classic, a Space Wolves list from a Gladius Task Force. So not in the classic Stormlands that we have seen previously. And I know I've gotten a lot of comments from people looking for ways to play Space Wolves outside of the Stormlands with all the Thunderwolf cavalry that we see typically. And this is a good example of one. Alex Spithopoulos went undefeated with the list, running an Apothecary Biologus with the Fire Discipline combo. So he's able to give his unit five plus critical hits, sustained and lethal. And he was joining into a six model Eradicator squad that could potentially mount into a Land Raider Redeemer that was also in the list. So using that combination to do insane melta damage rather than the voluminous bolter damage that we typically see. We also have, interestingly, a Calidus Assassin plus Bjorn the Fell Handed. These are two very similar Agents of Vex style CP taxing effects. So Bjorn the Fell Handed also has a CP tax effect alongside the Calidus Assassin. So you are able to potentially double hit a very important battle tactic stratagem that your opponent has or even hit two separate battle tactic stratagems that they have as well, making it incredibly difficult to use your standard battle tactics against this list. We had Harold Deathwolf as a Singleton Thunderwolf Cavalry. He's an interesting inclusion, and actually I think probably one of the better Thunderwolf Cavalry characters to include by himself because of his Mantle of the Troll King that allows him to, once per phase, after failing a saving throw, change the damage characteristic of the attack to zero. So if you shoot at him, he can turn one of his failed saving throws into a zero damage, effectively blanket. And then if you charge him, he'll be able to do the same thing in the fight phase as well, making him ridiculously hard to kill on top of being a toughness six, seven wound body with a four plus invulnerable save. He is pretty strong in melee as well. He has a six attack, two damage melee weapon. And just by himself, he's an 85 point uh, character who can sit around and be annoying to kill, stand on objectives, complete secondaries. He is actually an incredible inclusion, especially when not attached to any units because you are then taking more hits on that guy to then change the damage characteristics to zero. We also had Ragnar Blackmane. There is an Assault Intercessor squad in the list for him to join into. He gives that unit advance in charge permanently. It doesn't have to be in Assault Doctrine. They give him, as we just talked about previously, a full wound rerolls. And Ragnar Blackmane himself comes in with a ridiculous number of attacks on the charge with his Frost Fang, going up to strength eight, getting those wound rerolls, so he's able and 10 attacks. So he's able to swing dramatically above his weight class. We also had Logan Grimnar all by himself as well. He's just there for his once per game aura of uh, reroll charges and reroll hit rolls in melee. It's an incredible combination with Assault Doctrine. You can get a huge burst of speed out of the entire army, then also reroll your charges. So no one is really able to deploy outside of your threat range because you can inc wildly increase your average threat range across the entirety of your army. We had two units of Fenrisian Wolves as well as an Infiltrator Squad and two Scout Squads to act as utility units alongside no less than three 10-man Wolfen Squads. Uh, yeah, uh, not much else to say here. The Wolfen are actually incredibly strong inside the Gladius Task Force because unlike Stormlands, they actually give the Wolfen a way to get additional AP using Honor the Chapter while the unit is being affected by the Assault Doctrine. While the Wolfen having a high volume two damage melee attack are incredibly strong and an incredibly efficient melee attacker, the downside is that against Armor of Contempt enemies, or enemies with a high base save, they will often just bounce off with their low AP. And uh, that is a big boon for the Wolfen. It is a little CP hungry if you're trying to use it on what is not your standard Assault Doctrine turn when you would have to be spending for Adaptive Strategy to put the Wolfen squads into Assault Doctrine to get the combo off. But even then, it's probably worth it because you get these units to kill basically anything that doesn't have a, a damage reduction effect on top of them. Overall, super cool to see new varieties of Space Wolves come out of the woodwork. 
Obviously, it's not all Stormlands for this faction. They have such a deep bench of incredible characters. Harold Deathwolf doesn't even get talked about. And that guy has just Adept of the Omnissiah built into his data sheet, essentially, for himself, which makes him one of the best solo characters in the faction. Uh, but he doesn't even get played because he gets overshadowed by Stormlands so often. And there are a lot of characters and units like that inside Space Wolves that, that can see some play. Now, speaking of powerful Space Marine characters, let's talk about Black Templars. They were able to take down the Game Bunker Spring GT. They were piloted again with a Gladius Task Force by Andrew Voucher. Andrew was running another Apothecary Biologus plus Fire Discipline combo that we've just talked about. This one was also attached into an Eradicator squad. So a little bit of convergent evolution there. This one also has two captains, one of them with Artificer Armor, one of them with the Honor Vehement. Those guys running Power Fists and they are attaching into Primaris Sword Brethren squads. In total, three units of five Primaris Sword Brethren. One of them also attaching in with High Marshal Halbrecht. We then have two eradicator squads one six man for the apothecary biologus to jump into one three man just as another little anti-tank unit two inceptor squads both of them with assault bolters to act as utility a land raider redeemer for the uh, big eradicator squad plus two black templars impulsors that have built-in multi multas and a standard impulsor to house the six man primaris sword brethren squads we then had last but certainly not least a scout squad to act as utility. Now we're gonna move on to Bedlam in the Berg, where we did see a bit of a classic Ironstorm spearhead piloted by Ryan Snyder to a 5-0 record. Ryan was not bringing any particular Space Marine chapter, not using any uh, specific Space Marine chapter units, so just in classic Space Marines. The list was led by three Tech Marines, one with the target Augury Web, alongside one with an Adept of the Omnissiah, and one with the Master of Machine War, the triumvirate of enhancements that make this attachment so strong. We then added a ton of light and medium vehicles, three Predator Annihilators, as well as three Predator Destructors to cover all the list bases. Those were followed up by three Repulsor Executioners, a Storm Speeder Hammer Strike, and a Storm Speeder Thunder Strike. Uh, no infantry in the list besides the Tech Marines themselves, so just a bunch of Space Marine vehicles. While we've seen a lot of different varieties of Ironstorm Spearhead, usually they bring some sort of utility unit. Not today. This list was just running a ton of vehicles and super efficient vehicles alongside the combination of uh, that adept of the Omnissiah with the special vehicle synergies that Ironstorm Spearhead brings along with them. Just a mass volume of pretty solid shooting from the Repulsor Executioner's small weapons alongside the Predator Destructors, which are equipped with not only their autocannon, but also heavy bolters on their spawns and mounts. Those could be buffed by the two Storm Speeders, the Hammer Strike and the Thunder Strike, to buff AP or wound ro uh, rolls against monsters and vehicles that those uh, guys shoot at, respectively. Those could also then be buffed by lethal hits from Adept of the Omnissiah, and we had those floating rerolls for the higher value attacks from the uh, Repulsor Executioners and the Predator Annihilators Laz Cannons as well to make the list wildly efficient. Scoring could, I guess, potentially be a problem with this list, but uh, we do have those Storm Speeders that can jump in uh, when needed to perform action or uh, run around the table. We also uh, have just so many vehicles that are all relatively fast and with Master of Machine War can potentially even advance and perform actions if called upon to do so. And uh, those taking a turn off with one of those guys to score some action. And so, and taking a turn off with those guys to score some secondaries, I don't think is the end of the world, especially because the Predators come in at such an efficient points value. But now speaking of vehicle-centric lists, Let's talk about the big one for this weekend because staying with Bedlam in the Berg, we also saw Marcus Caho go undefeated with an Imperial Knight Noble Lance. Now this is basically aping the Chaos Knight style of knight compositions, but in an Imperial Knight's way. It is bringing Canis Rex, the big man himself, the big character for his ability to absolutely shred stuff in melee, and then also bringing four Armager Helverins and six Armager Warglaives. A total of 10 Armagers to spread around the effect of their floating reroll uh, one dice to hit every one of their activations. That also gives the list a huge volume of high objective control units. So they're very good at competing on primary with a wide variety of enemies. And they are not the easiest thing to kill between rotate ion shields if they need it and the baked in feel no pain that they get from being in the noble lance. These guys are actually deceptively hard to take down. We then have a Calidus assassin in the back to score some secondaries. And overall, hey, if it works for Chaos Knights, 
Why can't we make it work for Imperial Knights? And we also get those big, super high efficiency, large Knights out of Imperial Knights as well with Canis Rex coming in there too. Super cool list. Nice to see Imperial Knights back on the undefeated track and we'll hope to see them more often in the future. Now, moving on to factions that we have seen very often in the, in the past and maybe we'll see in the future. We can move to Eldari who took down the Anzac Cup. Dale Mann was playing Vrain, an Autark Wayleaper with the Phoenix Gem alongside Fuegan the Fire Lord. Now, Yvrain was not the Warlord, so he didn't get the benefit of the Yanari sort of allied mechanic, but that means that the Autark Wayleaper is there to generate additional command points for the army. We had a big unit of 10 Storm Guardians alongside a Wave Serpent, three units of Dark Reapers, two units of Skyweavers, a support weapon platform, two units of Swooping Hawks, a big 10 model Harlequin troop, and three units of Warp Spiders as well. This is essentially the list that we saw Liam Vissel do incredibly well with last week in immensely high volume MSU style of Eldar. Done are the days of taking uh, enormous bricks or huge Wraith Knights to stomp all over the opponent. We're going to be playing in a very Eldar fashion, running all over the table, jumping everywhere, using uh, Fire and Fade or Shoot and Scoot abilities with the Shadow Spectres or just with uh, Phantasming and using Fire and Fade naturally to get units in into whatever position we need to score our secondaries. We also have a lot of very maneuverable units with the Warp Spiders and the Swooping Hawks, and that makes this army incredibly good at scoring points. One of the most maneuverable armies in the game, alongside some damage if we super duper need it. We can focus fire with units like the Dark Reapers, Shadow Spectres, and Skyweavers against vehicles specifically, or get into melee with our Tolican troops and kill what we need to in order to be able to win uh, using the finesse of the army and its scoring potential. And we have seen this list do fairly well over the last couple weeks. Now, another list that plays relatively similar is the next one we're gonna be talking about from the uh, number three GT. This is going to be Alejandro Mancuso Serrano running Grey Knights. Uh, Alejandro was running two Brotherhood Librarians, a Brotherhood Tech Marine, Castellan Crow, and one Sigil of Exigence Nemesis Grandmaster. We then had a five-man Brotherhood Terminator squad that could potentially jump one of the librarians into it, which keeps both the Terminators and the Librarian alive a little bit longer. Uh, not only are those models super hard to kill and regenerate even if they're off the table with the Narthesium in the unit, but we also get the benefit of the Psychic Hood on the Librarian. And that means that if the Librarian uh, flubs his Vortex of Doom and ends up doing Mortal Wounds to the, the unit, you can actually s potentially save them on the Terminators and then regenerate the Terminators uh, with that Narthesium uh, instead of just putting the damage directly onto the Librarian and having him die uh, eventually. We then have a big purifier squad, 10 purifiers with four incinerators to attach in with Castle and Crow. Those guys could jump into a Land Raider Redeemer. And we also had three Nemesis Tread Knights to back that up with some pretty solid long range shooting. Overall, a good kind of combination of the classic MSU and librarian focused builds that we had for Grey Knights, but also a little bit of that new vehicle focus and long range shooting focused spice that we have had more recently. But it is also cool to see the Purifier Squad be, uh, taking a central focus in this list because that is not something that we've seen in a while. Um, but if you need to clear infantry, the Purifier Squad is ridiculously good at clearing infantry, comboing nicely with the Nemesis Red Knights that are very good at clearing higher armor targets. Now, speaking of higher armor targets, let's move on to the Double Decker Decimation where Chase Campbell went undefeated with a Necron Canoptic Court. Now, this is a fairly standard variety of Canoptic Court that we've been seeing very uh, similar varieties of over the last couple of weeks. It is running both Catan Shards of the Nightbringer and Void Dragon, Immotech the Stormlord to generate command points for it, two Plasmancers jumping into two units of Immortals to do some mortal wounds to stuff, alongside two Technomancers, those guys attaching into two units of Canoptic Wraiths, one of them with Dimensional Sanctum to give that unit a forward deploy. We have a little bit of backline shooting being brought by four Locust Heavy Destroyers, one unit of two, and two individuals, alongside two Canoptic Doomstalkers, and a little bit of utility being added by a Canoptech Scarab Swarm with three swarms in it. We've been talking about lists very similar to this for a couple of months since the release of the Necron Codex, and I don't think this list is really going anywhere unless we see some changes to maybe some of the units inside it. I think you probably see some changes to the Catan Shards uh, more than anything. But obviously, Necrons have not been absolutely destroying the metagame for a while, and I don't even know if it's necessary to change them too much at all in this stage. That said, the Canoptic Court is still an incredibly powerful 
archetype. It runs a ton of high v resilience units, canoptic rates, and the Catan shards being super duper difficult to kill, backed up by invulnerable saves and also feel no pains, and adding some backline shooting from the Doomstalkers and the Locust Heavy Destroyers, and a little bit of skirmishing action from the Immortals and the Stratagems that the Detachment gives these units access to. Now, speaking of hard to kill, Steven Platten taking down the Pandemonium GT using Death Guard. Steven was running a big battle line of Plague Marines. Three units of Plague Marines, two units of five, and one unit of ten. We had a Foul Blight Spawn and a Biologus Putrefier to attach into what is likely the ten-man unit, alongside a Death Guard Sorcerer in Terminator armor and Typhus. We had two Death Guard Rhinos for those Plague Marines to jump into, and a bunch of backline shooting. Two Plague Burst Crawlers, two Predator Destructors, as well as a fetid, as well as two Fetid Bloat Drones to add a little bit of utility. I talked last week about the synergy that the Predator Destructors have alongside Death Guard, able to reduce enemy toughness and potentially even armor saves, makes the Destructors much more reasonable than they are normally with their kind of mid-strength, mid-AP uh, auto cannon. We also, in order to follow that up with some strong melee, saw two units of Death Rod Terminators, one of six and one of three. Those could attach in the Terminator characters, both Typhus and the Terminator Sorcerer uh, are incredible attachments for those guys. The Terminator Sorcerer making those guys harder to damage in if he's attached into the unit. Typhus making them harder to hit. And you can compound that with the minus one weapon skill or ballistic skill that you can already give enemies with, with your contagions. We then had two Nurglings as well to act as utility and potentially add an additional minus one to hit to the army to make those big Death Shroud bricks even more annoying to engage into. This is a super tough list. It's able to put a lot of shooting downrange and really dominate the midboard between the Plague Marines and the huge bricks Death Shroud. And that obviously worked out pretty well for Steven, who was able to go five and oh. Uh, we're moving down towards the end of the list here, but we have a couple more factions to talk about. The next one we are going to jump into is Montana Beer Hammer, where Colin K went undefeated with Adeptus Sororitas. Now, this used differential scoring, so uh, the games had a pretty reasonable chance to be a draw, and Colin and did end up going 4 0 and 1 at this event. So, four wins and one draw on his record, but that just means that one of his games was within five points of his opponent's score. Colin was running a Hallowed Martyrs detachment with a Canonist, Dialogus, and Missionary with Saintly Example to generate Miracle Dice when they die, a Palatine with the Blade of St. Eleanor to buffer damage, alongside St. Celestine, Morvenval, and the Triumph of St. Catherine. So we have a little bit of a, a return to the uh, Palatine, Triumph of St. Catherine, and Dialogus combo. You can combo attach the Palatine with the Dialogus and allow the have the Triumph allow the unit they are attached into to use multiple Miracle Dice in a single phase. Attach them into a unit like a Battle Sister Squad. We do have one Battle Sister Squad with an Immolator, uh, as well as a Retributor Squad, which is also available for the combo as well. And then just dump Miracle Dice into them. Two Miracle Dice per phase, which can automatically convert into lethal hits yeah, using the Palatine. We had two Immolators, as I mentioned, and two Sororitas Rhinos. The Rhinos were embarking some of the utility units uh, and uh, a unit of Arco Flagellants. We had three Crusader units in there, as well as a single Penitent Engine, a Seraphim Squad, Sister Novitiate Squad, and Big Ten Model Zephyrim Squad. Interesting, uh, because we could jump Celestine into the Big Ten Model Zephyrim Squad, and that uh, makes the unit much harder to kill. She's able to regenerate models back into the unit as well. Not really a combination that we see too much of, but it does make her a real backline threat, because she's hard to actually remove at wholesale. The unit is relatively difficult to kill, and with Miracle Dice can make good charges out of Deep Strike to steal opponent's objective just on weight of numbers. We also had a Kalidus Assassin in order to score some secondaries and a unit of Paragon Warsuits for Morvenval to attach to. All right, the lists so far have been interesting, but overall fairly banal because we are moving on to some insane Chaos lists, starting with Chaos Demons, which took down the Vanquish 2024 GT. Oscar Van Huytzen Husselson going undefeated with a Nurgle-focused variety of Chaos Demons. This list is absolutely insane. Running Epidemius, who's able to generate you command points when you kill seven models with Nurgle Chaos Demons. And given that the list is running a lot of Nurgle Chaos Demons, that's probably going to happen fairly often. The other benefit that that gives you is that it gives you CP regeneration, even if you are taking fixed secondaries, which this list might have been doing because it is incredibly uh, scoring focused. So it could be taking action 
focused secondaries and just uh, trying to perform cleanse or uh, deploy teleport homers either in the opponent's deployment zone or center of the table over and over and over again and doesn't get that little CP boost that you get from taking tactical objectives. Now, speaking of units that could perform actions, we did have two grid and clean ones, one a standard grid and clean one uh, with the endless gift to give him a four plus feel no pain while in Shadow of Chaos alongside Rodigus. We have a Mask of Slanesh to combo with those big, scary demons by giving enemies minus one to be wounded within six inches of them. We've talked about that combo in the past. It makes those toughest 12 models with a baked-in Feel No Pain super tough to take down. That allows the Great and Clean ones to continuously just pound on whatever is in the center of the battlefield. That then increases Epidemius' tally, and given that both these Great and Clean ones have an incredibly powerful Torrent weapon alongside their decent melee, they are very good at getting to that seven model tally in order to generate CP. We then had no less than five units of three Nurglings. Again, lots of units to uh, deploy teleport homers or do whatever actions we need. Two units of pink horrors to hold down objectives with high OC, incredibly difficult to kill bodies, plus a unit of plague bearers to objective secure. We had one unit of flamers and two units of seekers. The seekers can scout and move very quickly to get up the table and movement block enemies, prevent them from getting in and screening out your drops when you need to, or even clear out enemy forward deployers in the first turn. And we add some shooting with three War Dog Brigands. The War Dog Brigands combo fairly nicely with the Great Unclean One, who's able to reduce enemy toughness within 12 inches, which can then allow them to do a little bit more damage to higher toughness enemies, especially toughness 12 enemies that would they would normally uh, be a little bit questionable against. Overall, super interesting variety of Chaos Demons. Well, I think a lot of people are very focused on the damage-focused Chaos Demon lists that are running Lords of Change and Bloodthirsters, you know, maybe Shalaxi Hellbane, all these big, scary, greater demons demons that can do tons of damage. Demons also have another build available, which is focused almost entirely on scoring and holding territory. And that is essentially what Oscar was taking in this, this archetype and uh, clearly worked out well for him because he went 5-0. and Super cool list. And it is cool to see the double grid and clean one do well because I think the combination of Rodigus and the, and the standard grid and clean one is incredibly strong in the current format given that they are like basically free. Those guys are like 200 points a piece. That's insane. <laughs> Obviously a little bit more than that. Plus you have to pay for endless gift, but they are incredibly cheap. Now last but certainly not least, We've got one more list to talk about. Christian Brewers, Thousand Sons from the Moonsterland GT. Christian was running Aramon, two Exalted Disc Sorcerers, two Infernal Masters, one with the Umbralific Crystal, one with the Arcane Vortex, as well as a unupgraded Infernal Master and Magnus the Red. So no standard sorcerers, uh, only characters, Infernal Masters, and uh, Disc Sorcerers to slow enemies down. Those guys could join into one of the six units of Warp Flamer Rubric Marines that we had included in the army. Typically, you leave the Disc Sorcerers out to run around and, and do your uh, Capitalistic Rituals and slow enemies down with Binding Tendrils, but we had enough units for the Infernal Masters as well as uh, Aramon to join into to buff them. And we had two units of Cultists and one unit of Zangor Enlightened, as well as one Rhino to act as utility, screen out, and protect the Rubric Marines. Pretty cool to see a classic Rubric Marine-focused style of Thousand Suns after we've been seeing a little bit of a movement towards units like Forge Fiends and the Mutilith Vortex Beast. But obviously, it is a tried and tested archetype that we have seen for good reason in the past, because those Rubric Marines are incredibly strong when combined with the character buffs. They are incredibly strong when combined uh, with their rerolls, giving their rerolls to characters. They're almost an attachment to a character rather than the other way around, uh, as well as uh, capitalistic rituals, uh, being able to debuff enemies' defenses or even do additional mortal wounds, allowing those little Rubric Marine squads to trade up dramatically into units more expensive than they are. Adding the multiple scoring units, multiple units of cultists and uh, other units that can jump in and do some actions and, and take some objectives without having to commit expensive Rubric Marine squads is incredibly useful as well. And it is cool to see Thousand Suns back on the table and continuing to do pretty well uh, in this season as we move closer to a new Data Slate update uh, probably towards the end of the month. And with that, those are all of the best armies in Warhammer 40k for this week. Let me know down in the comment section what you think is your favorite. Please go check out my coverage of the ATC Florida from this past weekend. It was an absolute blast streaming that event. I think uh, team events that I've streamed so far, both the ATC and ATC 
have been an incredible vibe, super chill. Some of the best sportsmanship that I've seen in Warhammer 40K to date. Thanks everybody for hanging out. Big thanks to everybody who supports the channel as well. Helps me make all this content and get out to these events to cover them. You can join them at Patreon at patreon.com slash tactical tortoise or as a YouTube channel member in the membership link down below the video, as well as subscribing on Twitch where I stream most weekdays. Big thanks to all those people and thanks to you for watching all the way to the end. Remember to keep it classy, folks, and have happy working.